on the previous video, I was discussing this um, steady rest and, and how to adjust things. And my intention was to show the um, forces on the steady rest if you didn't have the end of the part running true out here in relation to up here. And I should have included this in the previous video, but I didn't, but I, I wouldn't normally even do it that way. I just did that for the purpose of a, a demonstration on what would happen, or maybe if you didn't have enough stock here on the part to skim a band for, the, for your rollers to run on, this is what I would normally do. But for the purpose of the, the previous video, I was trying to demonstrate if you had run out out here and you close the steady rest on it and it tries to force it close, you know, centered, then um, this would cause vibration when you go to do your turning. And there was much discussion about this and also about possibly extending the tailstock into the end of the part here and then uh, adjusting things. But let me, let me take the camera here and I'll show you something and maybe you can see it. I don't know, but see the part, I don't know if you can see behind here. You see the gap between the, the jaws here and maybe uh, there's a, a little bit of a gap here. The part and up there you can see uh, maybe, if, I don't know if the light's too bright. You can see there's gaps here between the jaws because the end of the part is just saw cut here and, and uh, it's not square or anything. There is one jaw on this thing touching, I think. But when I get these tight, this uh, this rough cut, this kind of rough turns surface on this bar, these jaws grip it really tight. As you saw before, I had to really hit it hard to move it. But normally I wouldn't be even doing this. I would be, um, I would be getting it to run pretty true and then, then I would skim a diameter here, which I'm gonna show you now. And then I close the steady rest on the diameter because I have like a eighth of an inch. I don't know where my calipers are, but there's, this is, this comes down to four inches and it's already got like four and a quarter, about an eighth of an inch of material all the way down here to come off. All right, let me, uh, let me see if I can demonstrate this here. I've opened the steady rest up here on this part. And I got it running reasonably true up here. It's within a few thousandths of an inch out here. But like I say, this is what I would normally do. But down here, I bring this up to uh, zero here. And then I, I uh, rotate the C-axis. See, it's running out, oh, I don't know, about 15, 20 thousandths, maybe, 20 thousandths, 20, 25 thousandths. But really, I'm not worried about that too much. This is what I'd normally do. On the previous video, I hammered that until I got it running true. And uh, you would do that if you had to, um, if you couldn't take any material off of this, these diameters, like if you had it almost finished or very close to finish, you would have to get it running truer than that, of course. But in this case, this is what I really did with all the rest of the parts, just the one I showed on the previous video. I, I hammered this around until I got it to run true. So if I close the steady rest, let me just close the steady rest on here and see what happens. You probably see this indicator jump a pretty good ways. Okay. I see it still, it runs a little better, but, but you really couldn't, you really wouldn't want to run the part like this because you would, like I said before, introduce vibrations. So what I'm going to do is change to my, um, I'm going to open this back up. I'm going to change to my finish tool and I'm going to just skim a little area right in here that, that it cleans up and then I run, and then I run the steady rest on that. That's, I should have showed that in the previous video, but I was demonstrating something else. And this is the way you would really do it if you were doing this. You would close the steady rest chuck on the part, get it running true. In my case, I've got a manual four jaw chuck, so I got to indicate it in. If you had a hydraulic chuck, you would just close it. Um, 
open the steady rest and, and skim a diameter and then re and close the steady back onto it. That's really the way you would do it. All right, I'm gonna close the doors. I've positioned the tool roughly close to the part here, and I'm gonna close the doors here, jog the tool down, and manually just skim this diameter up here a little ways. Okay, let me just make sure it cleaned up all the way around. Okay, it did. So now, we'll jog the tool just up a little bit. Out of the way. I made this wide enough here so it would kind of clear my steady rest wipers here. And I'll just close it on there. First, I gotta clean this off down here. Make sure it's clean. And I don't have any shavings between the rollers here. Close it down. So that's the way, that's the way I would really do it. And that'll run true, of course, to the to the rotation because we just skimmed it. Um, but, but like I say in the previous video, I was trying to demonstrate something else that's kind of completely different. But now we should be running true. You see it was still running out like I showed like 25 thousandths out here, but that's all going to clean up when I do the turning, the rough turning, the second rough turning, I guess you might call it, you know, because I left an eighth of an inch of stock all the way down here. And uh, also, there was a few questions about that as well. And the reason that they're being done this way is because the customer wasn't sure of the finished dimensions yet. And I, and I asked him, well, if I rough it within an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch on the diameter to the finished sizes you initially gave me, would that all clean up to whatever you come up with? And they said, yes. Yeah. So that's the reason that the parts kind of got roughed and then taken out of the machine and then put back like this. So this was kind of necessary because, you know, if they had been done all in one setting, of course, you could just turn them and finish them. But I couldn't do that in this case.
Okay, I had to lift it that way because I want to try to get it up in the spindle without scratching up these surfaces on there. And I found that that clamp would kind of uh, let me do that. It kind of balanced on the clamp. But now I got to snug the jaws up a little bit. I've got this um, aluminum sleeve on here because I didn't want to mar up that surface, although it's not a close tolerance. I still didn't want to mark it up because these jaws on these uh, chuck jaws aren't in perfect shape. I'm gonna snug it up a little bit here. You may have noticed these things on here. I don't know if you could see them. Let's see. These, uh, these tie down pieces that I have, and they're not to support the part for machining, but with this part with the flange sticking way out here like this, just chucking on the shaft, it supports itself good enough to machine, but it'll, uh, it'll ring like a bell. And so what I found is that I could snug these up with some, uh, some rubber behind here, just hand tight and, uh, keep it from ringing so much as well as put a couple of magnets on here too just for the finish cut on this bigger flange face is all I need it for but I have to position this zero my notch here if you can see that there's a notch in here that you saw me make on the last operation that I'm going to indicate from my zero point and I've stuck a um I stuck a sticker on here you might be able to see that right here, kind of roughly where my zero point has to line up because I'm drilling holes in this flange and I don't want to hit these, these uh, pieces, these tie down uh, support things with the drill. Cause they're, I mean, I can back them off, but I don't want to hit the stud either. So that's kind of the reasoning. I'm trying to get this roughly in a line with my sticker here. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to indicate it to get the final zero point. Before we do any adjustment to the jaws, I have them a little bit snugged up. And what I want to do is get this to run reasonably true. You can see we're running up. I'm going to hit it. This has to... Um, oops, the other way, actually. I was thinking backwards here. This, if I hit it on the bottom, the bottom it's going to kick this this way so something like that not too bad There's no point in getting this perfect right now. I just want to get it kind of close because when we adjust these jaws for the run out of the OD, it's going to change again. So it's within a couple thousandths. So that's good enough for that right at the moment. Put my uh, other indicator. In here because it has more, obviously has more travel. Gonna adjust the jaws to get the run out of the flange pretty good. I'm gonna come up to zero. First I'm gonna I'm gonna rotate to a jaw here. Set it on zero with the x-axis. Rotate all the way around to the other side. Okay, this side has to come up about 20 thousandths. I'm gonna take a tension on the lower jaw. Um, back off. I might be blocking the indicator here. Can't really see it too good. But I can see it. Back off that jaw a little bit. Come up to the... There's my halfway... There's my halfway point. I'm going to re-zero the x-axis right there. So now I've 
I've got a zero that's pretty close to where I want it. I'm going to check it on the other side of these jaws again, the, the jaw opposite that one. So it's pretty close. Now I know this one has to come up the zero in the bottom. I'm going to back the tension off of this jaw just a little bit. I don't want to get these too tight yet. Because I won't be able to... Uh, it'll be kind of difficult to change it when I indicate the face again. Tighten this one a little bit. Okay. Now I've got that kind of roughed in. I put my other indicator back on here. I'm gonna bring it onto the face again here. Bring it back to zero on the indicator. Like that. And we're going to run this around again. I see it probably changed because I, these jaws, you know, they spring out and do whatever they do when you tension them tighter. And so, uh, things change a little bit. There's no point in trying to get it perfect all at once. And I'm going to hit it down here and it's going to kick it this way. It's going to push that into the indicator. here too. Don't really like the hammer directly into an indicator, but I can't really hit on the top here because I'm going to be hitting the indicator. Also this flange on this part might not be perfectly flat too, because I had it chucked here with these chuck jaws way back here, as you saw in the previous operation, and this even though this is a pretty heavy piece of metal, it still pulls it around a little bit. But it's a... I'm not really concerning myself if I'm moving the part in and out of the jaws right now because I'm going to set my Z0 after I get all this running through. One of the previous parts I've kind of learned that I can't get this absolutely too far, absolutely perfect. You can sit here and fight for a thousandth or so, but okay, probably. If I get it within a thousandth or I see I'm not getting there. I'm gonna hit this up here. Okay. See the, the flange, what I'm fighting here is the flange really isn't flat. Might be the best I can get it. It's within about a thousandth and a half. Now we're going to recheck the going to recheck the OD here. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I should turn that. not too bad. 
going to check all the jaws and make sure they're tight. Check it one more time with this indicator. I hope you can, uh, if I tip this more this way, you can see it better. You see how it moved a little bit? See how the flat, see how it's not flat? See how we're, we're indicating it's kind of staying still here and then all of a sudden it moves a little bit. Then it moves a lot right there for a li very little rotation. The flange here is just not that flat. That's, see how it's staying steady there and then all of a sudden it moves. So that's with intolerance. I'm not gonna fight for a few thousandths of an inch. The print calls for 10 thousandths. So this is well within tolerance. So now, I'm gonna bring this timing mark up here, right here, and we're gonna run, with this indicator, we're gonna run our V axis to zero, get out here a little bit. We'll run the V axis back up to zero. You can kinda of see that moving there. We're gonna run over here, I'm gonna unplant the spindle so I can rotate it. Run my Y. I'm gonna run my Y to zero. Alright, I'm looking at the, the amount this indicator swings right here. And you can see it's the C has to go that way. There's no there's no point in adjusting your indicator to try to get it in that slot until you get this roughly centered. So C's got to come a little bit more that way. Like that. I think I went maybe a little bit too far. Okay, now I'm gonna put the indicator up in there closer, but I'm not gonna put it in the slot yet. And let's see where I'm at. See, I can move the C back a little bit this way until I get it sort of close. Then I can stick my indicator up in here. See, I'm touching on that side. I'm gonna reduce the resolution of my jaw. I'm gonna back off the indicator a little bit on that side. Okay, now I'm touching on both sides. I'm gonna I'm gonna reduce the deflection on this indicator just a little bit. I'm gonna find my my null point. It's right there. Or maybe a little more. That's my null point of the indicator in the slot. Then I'll turn it around. Get my null point there. And then I'm going to uh, jog it half that distance or approximately. I'm going to re-zero my indicator here. That's me. Closer, closer up yet. Okay, that's pretty darn close. Okay, I'm happy with that. Comment, some people have asked me this, so I, I'm gonna show it. I've got to go to my work offset key here. Of course, that's soft key. And this is the offset I'm using, G54. So I'm gonna run the cursor down to the C axis right here. And I'm gonna go teach. 
I'm going to enter a zero over here, push the input. And then to verify that, so it changed that to now a zero point, which is our machine zero right here. And then I'm going to come over here and hit reset. And now we're at C zero. Now I need to put the um, hammer probe, the hammer probe in there in the spindle. Look at it over here. So I'm going to jog this away and Z. Now in order to get the tool out of this machine in, in the spindle here when you're doing it in the manual mode, you got to orient the spindle. So the, this this will spin the indicator a little bit. Some people, that, they got started with that on the last video, but it, it's not going to rotate. This, you can't turn the spindle on on this machine with the doors open, neither the turning spindle or the milling spindle. So I can orient it, but it doesn't go fast enough to throw that indicator off the the arm and then I'm going to release the tool otherwise you can't release the tool with a spindle isn't oriented I don't know that's some kind of safety feature maybe I don't know and you have to have the b-axis horizontal like this too in the or b0 position is what this is or you can take a tool in and out of the spindle it's kind of a little bit of a pain that's the way they made the machine so now I'm going to come up and now I'm going to index manually index the v-axis to 90. And I'm going to set my part zero or my z zero on the back of this, but I'm going to calculate it as an inch and a half so that it will set it up here, an inch and a half forward of the, or this direction from that. I don't want to hit the probe on there because It'll break it, of course. Come back here, and we're gonna set our we're gonna calculate the Z zero an inch and a half this direction. We're gonna look we're gonna keep pushing this arrow key here until we see the work offset soft key. Select that, and we're gonna come down to the Z with our cursor. Right here on, on the this G54 offset is the one we're using, and we're going to go teach. We're going to 1.5 over here inches. Um, this is it's kind of funny on the Mesa Troll. It's opposite. So when you're going towards the chuck, normally it's in a minus direction in Z. But if you're teaching the offset, you're going to teach it to the um, positive direction from here. On, on a, it seems backwards to me sometimes with this, but this is the way the Mazatrol works. Or I guess to, make, to understand it, I guess you could say that you're gonna teach it an inch and a half positive from the position it's setting at. So we go 1.5, had the teach enabled, 1.5, push input. You should see this number change just a little bit. Maybe you could. Then we'll go back to um, the position display here. And right now that's not reading right till we hit reset. And now we're at minus one and a half inches. So that face of the flange I already know is is an inch and a half in in Z. So so we set the the X and Y on Y zero is already set from previous the previous part. Although we're gonna we'll check it later, but but uh, right now we're good to do the turning part of this. Okay. Now I'm going to come over here I've got these two little um, pieces of this is just some eighth inch silicone rubber I had and I'm going to put them behind these uh, jack screws I'm just going to snug that up by hand over here here I'm just going to stick this in here and the only purpose for this is not because it like I said it needs the support now, I already tested this with a dial indicator. If I just tighten it by hand here, I can't really move the part. This part is so strong, I can't really move it. But this will be enough to damp out some vibration. And in fact, I'm even gonna add some magnets on here later. But right now, I'm just gonna put these on here. And 
And for the actual finish cut, I'm gonna put some magnets in between here. And don't ask me why, but when you stick a magnet, I'm not gonna stick it on there right now because it's hard to get off of there. This is a very strong, um, one of these, um, I don't know, you know, rare metal magnets or something. It's really strong. And they won't fly off. I already tested this at the speed I'm taking the finish cuts on the bigger diameters or the face of the flange above the, the um, shoulder that's turned on here. But I don't want to put it on when I do my face rough facing and stuff because it gets up to a high enough RPM it might throw this off. But for some weird reason, it's like, like when you stick a magnet on an anvil, you know, and the anvil rings. And, uh, well, let me do this. Let me, let me show you. Let me actually take these off and I'll show you. Maybe you can hear it in the camera's mic. I don't know. Maybe. Let's see. So if I take this Allen wrench, just hit it with the handle. You hear that rings? You might be able to hear that. Well, when I'm taking my finish cut, it tends to want to start, you know, vibrating and chatter a little bit. I mean, it, it's not really enough to matter, I guess you might say, but it, it bothers me and I just want to try to make the part as best that I, you know, I don't want chattery finishes, although it's intolerance, but so I'm gonna put these um, rubber things back in here. Now just with the rubber, I'm gonna hit it again. See, it rings just a little bit less. I don't know if you can hear that difference. Now, you gotta be careful with these things because they can, like that, and then I rotate this around. I'm gonna stick another one on this side. Now, I tried doing this with just the magnets, but it, it, it needed a little bit more. The magnets almost do it by themselves. I don't know if you can hear the difference between that. See how much faster this, the ring damps out? It's, it's kind of subtle. You might not be able to hear it on the mic on the camera. I don't know. But just the magnets by themselves wasn't quite enough. And I can sit here and override the feed rate, I mean the spindle speed, I, I should say, up and down 10% and damp out the vibe, you know, the chatter or the, um, not really chatter, it's just like a frequency this thing rings at. Um, or I can put this on here and, and maybe, you know, maybe it'll, uh, I won't need to sit here on the, on the spindle override. All right, here's the machining operation. There's going to be a lot of coolant in this um, part of the video because there's just nothing I could do to get rid of this coolant. I've got to run the coolant, and so for those people that uh, get weird about blurred pictures or coolant, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I could do about it. I, I just have to run the coolant on some of these tools. I ran without coolant where I could, so you'd be able to see. This is the facing operation, just facing up the rough stock that's left on the end of the bar. Had to take 700 thousandths off the end here. Just doing it in five cuts at the speed and feed you saw earlier. Then I'm gonna um, come out and index the B-axis to 90 and turn going uh, down the length for this shoulder. I suppose I could have done this all with a facing cut, but I just didn't do it that way for some reason. I, I can't even remember why, I just programmed it the other way. I wanted to separate the two roughing cycles because I had different uh, amounts of material coming off the ends of some of these bars, so I, I wanted to adjust that so I didn't take a bunch of air cuts. And maybe that's why I did it. I, I can't remember now. So anyway, that's the rough facing. It's gonna come back and rotate the tool, index the bead is to 90 degrees in this case, and rough. I think it's doing the same surface footage and feed, but I think it was only taking like about eighth of an inch per pass this cycle. I'm going to switch to the uh, finishing tool, but first I'm going to take a, a kind of a rough, well, 
it's going to finish the face first, I should say, this, this lower part of the face, and then it's going to come back and do kind of a rough finish cut on that flange area. Because when you're dragging a 30, this is a 35 degree diamond insert, you'll see right here it's going to index to 90 with the B and come back. Now I'm sticking the magnets on there because this part of the cycle runs at a slow enough RPM and won't throw those magnets off. And that's the feed and speed you see there. But it's just taking a rough, sort of a, a rough slash finish cut down this face, leaving three thousandths of an inch to come off when it, when it faces, back faces up the face. With this um, 35 degree diamond insert, if you try to take too much of a depth of cut, coming back up a face like that, it gives you kind of trouble because the lead angle is very steep, you know, it's only got like a five degree clearance on the insert facing backwards like that. And so if you if you got more than a few thousandths to take off, it's going to cause problems. And with this part having a tendency to ring, it would even be more so. I found it easier to hold the mic upside down like this to do this because I was it was barely being able to catch on the end of this diameter. That's the tolerance of the diameter there. Just under 10 inches. This is a 10 to 11 inch mic here. And this is just to put a start hole for the um, drill. The, the drill I'm using here is a real long drill. I didn't have a drill that would... Uh, my shorter drill of this size, this Allied Spade drill, wouldn't go deep enough. And this is the only other longer drill I had. I didn't want to buy another tool, so I just was using it. So I have to put this starting, kind of a starting counter bore in here to start the drill in to make sure it doesn't wobble around when it starts in there because it's such a long drill. And it, it was too short to drill all the way through the, the bar, and it was kind of too long, but this is the only tool I had. And the, the tool changer won't handle a tool this long, so I have to manually put it in and out of the spindle. This machine will only handle a tool that's 19 and a half inches long in the changer, and that tool is longer than that. So as I said before, this is an allied spade drill. Just, uh, I think it's got a high speed cobalt tip on it. I don't really remember the feed and speed I was running here. It's probably like 120 surface footage and maybe four to six thousand speed per revolution. I can't remember. And it was only drilling halfway through, actually. It's a chamfering tool. This is actually a, a spot drill. I'm just chamfering a a 45 by 130 drawing called for there on the end of that hole. It's the same end mill I milled the counter bore with again and I was just putting some starting notches in here because these holes slightly intersect this that 10 inch diameter. I really can't put this drill in there with that situation. It would hit the shoulder. Sorry about the coolant here but as I said, there's nothing I can really do about this. And my coolant is kind of dirty on this machine. I need to change it, but I'm resisting that because there's this machine holds like 300 gallons of coolant. So that, you know, that takes like a half a drum of coolant at $1,600 a drum. I'm kind of like, I don't know if I have to do that. If I don't have to do it, I'm not going to do it. But it's not good for video recording. It's a 5 8 5 fluid end mill and just milling these uh, holes because these were, well this hole was an inch and a quarter, no an inch and one eighth hole and the other holes were like 775 thousandths in diameter if I remember so it's kind of an oddball size so I just decided to mill these so I drilled it. That drill previous to this tool was a uh, 708 thousandths believe 708 thousandths diameter something like that and then I was just milling these out to size helix helixing down I kind of cut out a bunch of this because you it's all the same thing you didn't want to see it I was trying to get as good a video as I could with all this coolant 
So this is actually the last tool in the program. So that's that's basically all there is to this end of the part. Just facing this off and uh, turning that 10 inch diameter and doing these holes and drilling this hole in the center. So that's all there is. Blow it off and change to the next part at the indicated end.